Hello, uh, this is a video on uh, hand calculations uh, for framed structures and for virendeel girders. Uh, this is the, the fifth video in a series and it will only really make sense if the previous videos are worked through. Uh, the overall aim of the series is to uh, sh show how to carry out approximate analysis of a multi-storey frame and a virendeel girder. So, um, Actually, this, this video is going to be on um, multi -story, a multi-storey frame. Uh, we're going to look at some, you know, three st we'll start with three-storey and then we'll get bigger and bigger. And here's a, here's a photo of a multi-storey frame, a fabulous multi-storey frame which I took off Google. It's a, I think it's a hospital building in America. So uh, here we go. This is what we've done so far in the other videos. So uh, we looked at a stiff beam frame, just single story, and then a a frame with constant EI, again single story but with pinned feet, and then a constant EI frame with fixed feet, and then uh, in the last video we looked at uh, a two-story frame, a single bay two-story frame, and this, in this video we're going to look at multi-story frames. Okay, so we're going to finish off multi-stories in this video, hopefully. So let's have a look at a, uh, a two-bay three-story structure, which um, uh, it's not that difficult to analyse, uh, strangely enough. Uh, we, we typically start uh, by considering uh, the stiffness of different members and points of contraflexure within beams and columns. Okay, so actually I'm going to start off thinking about uh, points of contraflexure first. So this is a, this is a one, two, three storey structure, two bays, and there's 40, 40, 32 uh, horizontally uh, applied forces at each of the two upper floor levels and the roof. Uh, so here we are, three supports, seven metre bays, four metre storey heights. Okay, let's have a think about the deflected shape. Uh, I've already made some comments on my ability to draw deflected shapes. They're not great. However, we, we can try to think about uh, points of contraflexure um, in beams and uh, columns uh, through thinking about the deflected shape. So really, uh, I'm not sure how important it is to consider the deflected shape. The, the key thing is is that I know that where I have a, beam, a, a column which is um, fixed at both top and bottom and is liable to some kind of movement, uh, relative lateral movement, then it's going to develop uh, a point of contraflexure around about mid-height where I have a beam that may be rotated at each of its ends in different, different, um, uh, so to give bending moments in different um, directions, then again, uh, where you have a point of contraflexure, I'd expect it to appear somewhere in the middle. So broadly, I'm looking for uh, elements that are fixed and fixed, fixed and fixed, fixed and fixed, fixed and fixed, and then I'm saying that they could well develop a point of contraflexure. However, at the bottom, we have um, these single columns with a single uh, pin at the base, and they don't develop a point, uh, any uh, uh, contraflexure or bending. They just, they just are a, a vertical cantilever fixed at the top, pinned at the bottom, and a horizontal uh, support, a, a horizontal reaction applied at their bases. Okay, so let's think about uh, how we can develop subframes from these points of contraflexure. Well, uh, we, we choose to uh, create our subframes by cutting the structure as our pins because that simplifies our analysis. Where we have a pin, there's no bending moment, and therefore uh, that's one less um, calculation to fret over. So an obvious place to start would be an upper frame uh, based on the uh, three pins in the three upper columns. Uh, once we've done that, we can move down to the next subframe, which would actually be the ground first. It would be the second floor with the columns above and below. And then once we've finished with that, we can move down to the first floor with the columns above, which would have to go all the way down to the pinned bases at the uh, foundations. So we've got three subframes. We've got the upper one, we've got the second floor one, and we've got a first floor subframe. Okay, that's easy enough. How about the uh, way that uh, these horizontal react uh, horizontal forces of 32, 40, and 40 are resisted by 
the um, by the three columns. Right, uh, we've looked at this in the past, um, in the past videos, and we've said that where a column is held on just one side by a beam, it would only be half as stiff as a column which is held on both sides by beams. So I'm expecting the central columns to be twice as stiff as the edge columns. Therefore, they'll attract twice the load. Therefore, the reactions at the bases of these columns and the shears within these columns over its full height of the centre are going to be twice as much as in the outer edge columns. There we go. So now I'm looking at the, the top subframe. So this is the subframe, which is just the roof, and it's got two bays, and effectively it's, it's pretty easy to look at. We know that we've got this force of 32 kilonewtons applied. Uh, I've created my pins at mid-height of the columns, so it's a four meter story height, so it's two meters away. So I can work out my bending moments pretty quickly uh, once I know the shears within the columns. Well, if I have a, a horizontal force of 32 kilonewtons, acting on the subframe, I know that the central column is going to take twice as much as the outer columns. And by par partitioning up this 32 kilonewtons, I can say 16 in the centre, 8 on the edges. So there's a shear force of 8 kilonewtons over the full height of that column, but at the pin, I can assume that there's a force of 8 kilonewtons acting on a vertical cantilever. So effectively I'm saying that at this right hand side, I have 8 and it's 2 metres, therefore the bending moment it's going to be drawn and it's 16 kilonewton meters and I'm drawing it on the right because that's the tension phase of the member. At the center I've got something similar except this time I have a 16 kilonewton force over 2 meters so I'm going to have a bending moment of 32 kilonewton meters. Okay. So once I know the bending moment at a joint in the leg I know it's the same bending moment in the beam. And I can combine these. We've looked at uh, joints in the past where, so for instance, for the right hand side of the structure, if I have a bending moment here of 16, I know that I must have a bending moment in the beam of 16. Or if I look at the T junction uh, just here, I know I've got a bending moment uh, in this beam. Uh, uh, on the right hand side if I've got a bending moment here of 16 and in the left hand side I've got a bending moment there of 16 I know that to resist that I need a bending moment of 32 in the column to make sure that when I take moments around this point all the moments add up to zero and it just so happens that 16 times 2 is 32 kilometers. meters so I'm in equilibrium and the frame is looking good. So I've finished my upper sub frame. And now I'm going to move down to uh, the second floor sub frame. So here's the second floor sub frame, which is uh, just between these two points. I have to work out the horizontal shears in the columns. Uh, and I'll show you how I work that out now. So. I know that the horizontal, what the horizontal shears are in the columns above, because I've worked that out previously, it's 8, 16 and 8. I've got this additional horizontal load of 40 kilonewtons, which I know I have to share between the columns. The central column is twice as stiff as the inner columns, so I'm going to share this 40 out as 20 shear to the central column and 10 shear to each of the outer columns. So 20 plus 16 gives me 36. 10 plus 8 gives me 18, 10 plus 8 is 18. So that's how I've worked out my subframe reactions for this second floor subframe. Once I've got those, I can just develop my bending moments. I can think about where the tension faces are on these columns. So for instance, 18 times 2 gives me 36, 8 times 2 gives me 16. And so I, uh, I go on through the entire uh, structure. So it's probably worth, uh, we've already done this <laughs> for the uh, so th thinking about the left hand, um, the left hand column, where I have uh, a 16 kilonewton meter moment in the upper column and 36 in the lower column. That's right. Uh, and it just so happens then that, that the bending moment in the beam has to be uh, these two added together: 30, 40, uh, 52 kilonewton meters. And that's how I've calculated the bending moment in the beam at this point. I can do a similar exercise at the right hand side and it comes out to 52. 
and a similar exercise at the centre. Now I'm going to move on to the next level, uh, which is the first floor subframe. So again, I've worked out already what my reactions are at the base of the second floor subframe, which is going to be the same as at the top of the first floor subframe, but there are different directions for the shear. And then I add in 40 kilonewtons, which is split 20, 10, 10. Okay, so 36 plus 20 is 56. 18 plus 10, 28. And now I go ahead and calculate my bending moments in the same way that I did for the two-story frame in the previous example. In the previous video. Great. So there's my subframe for um, oh, the lower subframe bending moments. All the bending moments are given in kilonewton meters. And you can see that uh, the, the the bending moments in the beams are really large because the, 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 the combination of the two bending moments in the columns. So this central beam, it really, um, as, yeah, so the, both of the beams carry bending moments of 148 kilonewton meters uh, as their maximum, but the central column attracts twice the uh, bending moment uh, as the outer columns. All right, so now I want to uh, consider uh, assembling all of this, but I also want to consider uh, the reactions. So, thinking about the yeah, so thinking about the vertical reactions at the bases. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the whole frame rotates around this central point. You don't have to do this, but this is this is it's an, it's very arbitrary. This. So I'm taking a point of, of rotation here, and I'm going to say that there is no vertical reaction caused by the horizontal forces applied to the frame at this point, and that the whole frame will be kept in equilibrium by vertical reactions at the outside here and on the inside on the, on the right hand side here and on the left hand side there. So I'm going to take moments around this point here. So it's going to be 32 times 12 plus 40 times 8 plus 40 times 4 minus 2R times 6. So there it is, 32 times 12, blah, blah, blah. So R is a total of 61.7 kilonewtons. Now I can compose my entire diagram, which shows really useful stuff. So this is great. I can pass this on very quickly and I can also check um, analysis. This is quite a conservative approach to um, forces in foundations, however, there we are. Uh, so uh, I've got my horizontal and vertical reactions in the uh, foundations and bending moments throughout the frame. That's great. So now's a chance for you to have a crack at a multi-story uh, frame yourself. So here is the multi-story frame, two six meter bays, three stories, uh, 40, 80, 80, constant EI. I'm gonna give you a clue here, so just a little hint. So if you, if you wanna have a go on your own, do it. If you wanna have a look at the hint, have a look. Here are the internal shears which I've calculated, which may or may not be a help. And here are the um, reactions which I've calculated, which may or not be the help. So here are the un here's the answer. There it is for the entire frame. I'm not going to spend any time on this. Uh, and here's one more exercise for you to have a look at. So, so in a very short period of time, we've moved from getting to know uh, bending moments in frames to now we can look at a really major structure like this, apply these forces on the side, and we can look at it and we can say, uh, what are the bend what's the bending moment diagram for the entire frame here? So again, I've got a hint sheet, which is coming up next. And I've also got, uh, which shows the internal shears within the vertical uh, columns and the reactions. And then here is a, a partial solution. It's a partial answer to the entire uh, structure. So uh, that's the end of the video. This, is, this completes the video on uh, frame analysis. And the next video is going to be looking at Virendil Gerdes. So uh, thank you for watching and I hope uh, that this has made some kind of sense to you.